Hey, good morning. Great to see you guys. Beginning a brand new series this week called Hold On to Hope. As you can see, really excited to begin this. This will take us through and the next week, Christmas Sunday, and then also the week after that. So encourage you to be with us each week as we jump into this. Man, life is tough, isn't it? It's okay to admit it. Life is tough. Really tough. And sometimes giving it your best doesn't seem to be enough. I mean, when you're a kid, it's tough. Being a teenager is brutal. Any teenagers in the house? They're probably all still sleeping. Oh, okay. All right. Going to college, finding a job, getting married, having kids, navigating your career, managing health issues, money issues, marriage issues, personal issues. I mean, we can go down the list. Life is tough. Does anybody know what I mean when I say that it seems like you get a handle on one thing only to lose your grip on a couple other things at the same time? You felt like you got things balanced and all of a sudden it just kind of falls apart. If it's not marriage, it's money. If it's not money, it's health. If it's not health, it's kids. If it's not kids, it's your career. If it's not your career, it's your car. If it's not your car, it's, you know, again, you fill in the blank. You finally get one thing going, you finally get your handle, you know, a handle on one thing and you're like, okay, I can get this thing figured out and then something else falls apart. It's the reason I have little hair today, okay? <laughs> and on top of everything else, few plans go the way we expect, right? Now, I don't mean planning for bush gardens and then it rains or missing the $6.99 per pound ribeyes at Food Lion, or getting an 88 on an exam and you were hoping for a 90, or gaining four extra pounds over Christmas that you didn't calculate, you know. Those are things we can handle. I'm talking about when life takes a turn you never expected. A sharp turn. And as a result, your future is uncertain. There are some of you gathered in this room, there are some of you watching online, this past year was the worst year of your life. You are here today, but you have a heart that is broken. Crushed dreams, a confused future, and you're not sure what you're going to do now. You're not certain what tomorrow holds or next week or next month, and certainly what 2019 is going to bring your way. And whatever it was, it probably happened in one sentence, one phone call, one decision, and everything changed. Your position has been eliminated, and now you're looking at no job. I don't love you anymore, and your marriage is getting ready to fall apart. The tumor is malignant, and suddenly your future is uh, in jeopardy. Mom, Dad, I'm pregnant. I'm having second thoughts about the wedding. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. We're moving. We think mom's had a stroke. Can you get to the hospital quickly? One phone call. One sentence. Suddenly life takes a turn and you were not expecting to go that direction. You had everything set. You were pretty certain about what at least the next few weeks or the next few months or even the next couple of years was going to look like. And all of a sudden, you're in an entire different trajectory in life. One sentence, and we are ripped away from everything feeling normal, and we're thrown into an emotional and even spiritual storm. I've been there. Have you been there? Some of you are in that right now. For others of you, it wasn't really a jolt as much as it was a slow, almost unpredictable fade. A marriage slowly eroding, a teenager dripping away from the faith of mom and dad, a parent experiencing memory loss. And in those moments, I just want us to be honest over these next three weeks and as transparent as we can, in those moments, we feel lost. We feel overwhelmed. We feel as if we are drowning. Let's be honest, during those moments, it is tough. It is hard. It is difficult to hold on to hope. You put the smile on, you do the best you can to keep the outer appearance looking as normal and as together as as possible, but inside, if we could peel back those layers and look at what's going on, you are shattered. And you are doing the best you can to keep your head above water. You're doing the best you can to hold on to hope. And we want to hold on. 
We want to be resolved. We want to be a man or a woman or a teenager who doesn't give up. But it's difficult, complicated. You are drained. Your energy is almost gone. And it is especially challenging during this time of the year. Everybody is smiling, and not everybody, but many people are smiling and singing Christmas songs and wanting you to be jolly and be happy, and it's the most wonderful time of the year, and people are expecting you to share the Christmas cheer and come to this party and that party and wrap this gift and give a, come here and eat cookies and everything else, and you don't want to. In fact, if you could, you would crawl in a hole and hide out until this whole thing's over because everything seems to be an assault against your heart, your mind, your emotions right now. So the next three weeks, I'm going to do everything I can to provide some insight, to provide some wisdom, to provide some guidance about this process you're in and about how you hold on to hope when the truth is you feel like giving up. And I want to do it through two familiar stories, one from the New Testament, the Christmas story, and then one from the Old Testament, the Exodus story. Now let's begin with the Christmas story, just part of the Christmas story, just a a familiar part of the Christmas story, and hopefully I can draw a few things to your mind that you've maybe not considered before. And the reason I want to focus in on this particular part of the Christmas story is because unlike the image created from Hallmark cards and cute nativity scenes and Hallmark movies on TV and all those things, Mary and Joseph had it rough. I know on the cards, you know, they're all gold foiled and they're beautiful and Mary looks like she's just as happy as she possibly can be and Joseph is just as sweet and as gentle as he possibly can be and everything is just perfect, you know, and silent night, holy night, you know, no crying he makes and all those things that we sing about and we look on these cards and movies and paintings and images, but the reality is Mary and Joseph had it rough and I want to focus in on just one part the conceiving and the giving birth to the Messiah because it was not as planned. In other words, what she had to endure was not something she had planned. Her entire life took a sudden turn. Let me give you a little context to Mary and her situation, and hopefully you can feel just a little bit of this and just imagine what it must have been like to be Mary, what it must have been like to be Joseph. Mary was a young lady. When I say young lady, I'm talking about 15 or 16 years of age when this happened. In our minds, I think we have that she was in her 20s or maybe, you know, later, but she was about 15 or 16 years old at this time. And what seems like out of nowhere, an angel appears to her and lets her know that she will soon be pregnant. And the angel makes a promise that she will deliver the promised Messiah. How overwhelming do you think that was? She consents, she gives over her body, her womb, and everything she has to God to bring forth the Redeemer of the world, and of course, trying to convince her fiancé, Joseph, that she had been faithful to him, although she's pregnant, she had never slept with any other man, was almost an impossible task. We skip over that, but can you imagine that conversation? Joseph, I'm pregnant. Now, before your mind goes anywhere else, I want you to know I have not slept with anybody else. I have not been unfaithful to you. I have kept our commitment. We are engaged to be fully married. I have not. Can you imagine Joseph trying to wrap his mind around that? Joseph not only questions her, so does everyone else. They question her character. They question her reputation. All of it is called into question. She endures the scandal throughout all of her city. She answers tough questions from her family, from her friends, from from strangers. She goes through the pain of her body changing and growing and eventually labor. She's about 16 years old. If you have a 16-year-old girl, I want you to just imagine all of those emotions, all of that change, scandal surrounding her, her fiancé not believing her. Just imagine the emotional storm Mary had to go through. And she did that for nine months. Think about it. Now here's a detail you may have not thought about. Maybe you have. An angel comes at the beginning and makes this announcement to Mary. 
But there is no record of an angel returning to encourage Mary throughout the process. Now, if an angel would have come to me and made some promise to me that, you know, in nine months or ten months, something is going to happen, and after that evening of the angel's appearance to me, I would have needed that angel to reappear to me about every other day to keep me on track. But there's no other record of the angel coming back to Mary and saying, Mary, I just wanted to let you know that it's been four weeks now and you're doing a really good job. Just keep moving forward. Everything is on schedule. God is pleased with you. Uh, all of heaven is talking about you. You're doing an awesome job. Keep it up. And then four to six weeks later, Mary, I just wanted to drop in. I just wanted to encourage you again. You're doing awesome. You're about two months pregnant now. Everything is looking good. Four to six weeks later, he comes back, the angel reappears and tells Mary, you're on track, you're about three months now, four months. I would have needed that all the way through to keep me on track. But there's no, there's no mention of an angel coming back to Mary to keep her encouraged and to keep her on track. It's possible the angel never returns again. Mary has, could have experienced complete silence. An angel appears to Joseph, an angel appears to the shepherds, but an angel doesn't reappear to Mary and say, good job, good job, keep going. It is possible from the beginning to the end, there is complete silence in between. I'm not sure we appreciate how difficult this had to be for Mary and Joseph. Mary must have thought... Just, just, just go with me on this. Mary must have thought at some point, at least two months into this, three months into this, what if I missed it? I mean, what if an angel never really appeared to me? What if I just dreamed that? What if I'm not pregnant? What if the baby I have, because obviously it was, she was pregnant after a while, but what if the baby I have is not really the Messiah? What if I just imagined all of this? What if I just dreamed all of this? You know why I think she probably had these thoughts? Because I would have those thoughts. You would have had those thoughts. And I know human beings. Mary is special. Mary is amazing. Mary is beautiful. Mary is precious. Mary is, you know, gentle and humble. All those things. But Mary's a human being. Let's not remove that part. She struggled through that process. And it is in these moments... It is in these moments... These in-between moments... We doubt... It's in these in-between moments we grow discouraged. It's in these in-between moments we complain. It's in these in-between moments we become impatient. I know because I have been there over and over and over again. These moments, these in-between moments, somewhere between the beginning and the ending, the promise and the fulfillment, the sunset and the sunrise, it's in these moments in between everything when the angel's not there. When the baby hasn't come, it's in these in-between moments that everything gets really dark. Darker than you can imagine. It's in these in-between moments where it gets cold and lonely and it's bitter. And that is where some of you are right now. That's where you are. And I know. I've been there. I've had to walk through that time. I've doubted myself. I've doubted my friends, I have doubted God, I have doubted my future, I have doubted everywhere I was, where I was going, my plans, I have become discouraged, I have complained, oh my gosh, have I complained. I have become ill, upset, sick, anxiety ridden, impatient with myself, impatient with everybody else, I know what that's like, and you feel like Mary, carrying a promise of a better life, carrying a promise of a better future, but right now you're feeling confused and alone, and you are filled with a hundred questions, boy, and if God would show up, I mean like literally in the flesh, and he could pull up a chair beside you, you would go down an entire list of questions, wouldn't you? God, what about this? And I want to talk to you about this. And I want to ask you a question here, here, and here. And this doesn't make sense. And I don't understand this. And why don't you just show up? And why don't you do this? And how come you don't answer this request? And what is it you're leaving me in this darkness? And what's going on? You have all of these questions you want to ask God. I get it. Pastor Jeff Mannion wrote a book about what I'm describing here. It's actually called The Land Between. Finding God in Difficult Transitions. 
you get a chance to read it, you should. I linked it for you in the notes if you're following on version or the church app. The land between, let me describe what that is because I'm going to talk to you about it this morning. The land between is the space where we feel lost, lonely, and confused. You're not at the beginning, you're not at the end, you're in the middle. You've got a promise, but it hasn't been fulfilled. You're just kind of wandering around in between everything. Back there, when we were teenagers or we were in college, we had all this potential packed inside, or we were newly married and we were launching out into the wild blue yonder. You know, we had all these dreams and all these goals, and everything made sense. And up ahead, you know, we were excited about what was going to happen. And then again, when you look further into the future, one day, you know, when your kids are older and you have grandkids and you retire, maybe things will make sense and everything will kind of you know, come together and it'll all crystallize for you and you'll be able to look back on your life and the legacy you've left. So the, the beginning looks pretty good and the, the ending looks pretty good, but you are in the middle. And the alarm goes off every morning. And you're not so sure how your kids are going to turn out and you're not so sure what's going to happen with your marriage and you don't know what the prognosis is that the doctor has given to you. You're not so sure. You're in the middle. You're stuck in the land between. It's lonely. It's dark. And what I want to get across to you today, if I can do this in just a little time we have, what I want to get across to you today and over the next two weeks beyond today is simply this. Hopefully this will make sense. Within this space, within this compressed place where you are right now, fertile ground is made available for our transformation and for God's grace to be revealed in a way that you never imagined possible. It's in this place where you are right now. It's in this squeezing. It's in between the beginning and the ending. It's in those nine months that everything just seems dark and you wonder where's the angel again and why he can't show back up and encourage me. It's in this this space where you wonder how things are going to turn out and your heart's broken and your emotions are shattered and you're not sure what the future looks like and you don't know which direction to go and life turned in the direction you never planned. It's within this space where all this pain is and all this fear and all this wondering and all these doubts and discouragement and all these different things. It's in this space where fertile ground is made available to you. And in that fertile ground, your transformation can happen, and God's grace can be revealed to you in a way you never thought possible. And that's whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, or an agnostic, even an atheist, I'm telling you, if you will listen to what I say today, it is a, the space between is golden opportunity for you to be transformed. But, and this is a huge warning, it is also prime real estate for us to go resentful, bitter, and sarcastic. In fact, it is the reason some of you have virtually no faith at all. You see no need for God, especially if this God allowed your life to go as it did. So this wilderness, this land between, is where your faith died. And I see it often. In this place between, faith either lives and thrives or it dries up and it dies. So let's go back to that other screen, Mark, the first one. Not the first one, but the one before that. Within this space, fertile ground is made available for our transformation and for God's grace to be revealed. It is also, next screen, it is also prime real estate for us to grow resentful, bitter, and sarcastic. You've got one of two choices. And in this space, you will give birth to a new you or you will bury all future prospects once and for all. There's no better example of the land between than the time after Moses leads the Israelites out from Egyptian bondage and before they reach the promised land. 
It's recorded in the book of Exodus, and when you get a chance to read it, I say you sit down and try to read the whole book, if you possibly can, in one or two settings. It is just an incredible book, fast-paced, as Moses goes into, uh, into Egypt and leads the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt after over 400 years of bondage. It is in this space where they come out of Egypt, and before they get into the promised land, that space, that wilderness, that time right there is the land between, between bondage and promise. That's where you are. That's where Mary was. Some spiritual advisors suggest this is the only space in which radical transformational growth occurs. It's the only place. You, I don't have time to get into this today, okay? But I will. <laughs> That's the way I do things, right? <laughs> but he probably will, though. Even though he doesn't have time, it's almost as if he's confessing that and he just ignores it and moves on. I know those are the thoughts you have. We do not grow very well when everything is okay. <laughs> when we're prosperous and everything is happy and everything is going up and to the right, we typically do not grow very well. In fact, we, we don't do very well. It's not even good, really, for our character, our mind, our heart. More people get into trouble during prosperous times than they ever do during painful times. Yeah. Prosperity and health and wealth and all the food you want and all the comfort you want is more detrimental to your faith and to your heart and to your character than all the pain and the hurt and disappointment all rolled into one. That's just the way we are. I wish it weren't that way, but it is. So some spiritual advisors suggest that the only space in which radical transformational growth occurs is in this land between. It's in this wilderness, if you will, this dry place, this difficult place. And here is the key right here. Our response to what's going on in our life determines positive growth or stagnation and decline. How we respond to what is going on in our life determines whether we grow or whether we become stale. Whether we move to the next level or whether we become stagnant, whether we go up or whether we go down, whether we succeed or whether we fail, our response to what's going on in our life determines what's next. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the story of Exodus, let me just catch you up because there are some of you who didn't grow up in church. You're not so sure what all that's about. The only thing you know about Egyptian bondage and the Israelites is a movie or so you've seen or something on TV or some cartoon. That's all you know. So let me give it to you real quick, okay? A shepherd named Moses is tending his sheep, and he notices a blaze, a bush, a bush, a blaze. Let me get that the other way. A bush, a blaze. You try saying that over and again. But it's not being consumed. It's not burning up. So he turns to the bush, and when he turns to the bush, he hears God say, this is not a quote, but this is the gist of what God says, I am Isaac's God. I am Jacob's God. I chose, called, and provided for them, and now I have chosen, called, and I'll provide for you. He's talking to Moses. And God reveals his plans to Moses to use him to go back into Egypt, where all the children of Israel have been held in bondage for hundreds of years, to go back into Egypt and release the Israelites and bring them out of bondage. But before Moses leads them out of Egypt and into the promised land, they have to endure the wilderness, the land between. And it's actually a desert. Now listen to me carefully as I describe real quick a desert. It is dry. It is parched. It is hot. Little water, little food, and death is everywhere. That is where some of you are. You're in the desert. You are hot. You are thirsty. You are tired. You look around. You can't find much water. You can't find much food. And everywhere you look, there is death. And here's what's amazing. God led them there. Now, I'm not saying that if you're in a terrible, terrible place right now, that God led you to that place. But here's what I've learned. The only way to get where you are 
to where you need to be is to transition through a very difficult place. I don't know why all that is. I can give some theories. I can give some ideas. And I'd be happy to talk with you about that in private. But I have learned that the only way that I'm going to get from here to there is I've got to transverse a particular piece of land. I've got to go through something. And most of the time, that thing that I've got to go through is tough. That thing that I've got to go through is dry and parched and hot and there's little water and little food and there is typically death all around. And by the time I get from where I am to where I need to be, I'm a different person. And the only thing that makes me different is the journey I've taken through that very difficult place. Now, if you know the story, if you read the book of Exodus, it was not the Israelites' finest hour. Okay? Why? Because again and again, each time they came up against difficulties in the wilderness, they complain, they murmur, they gripe, and they whine. It's actually somewhat humorous if you'll just read through and see all the times they whine and complain. Now, it's not fun when you're in it. And trust me, I have done my fair share. Don't ask Lana, but I have done my fair share of complaining. And I've done my fair share of murmuring, and I've done my fair share of griping, and I've done my fair share of whining. Anybody else in here like that? Anybody married to someone who does that all the time? Okay. Yeah. Let me give you three examples, okay? This is just quick. Three examples. One, and I hope I get this across well. One, the bitter water incident in Exodus 15. As soon as the Israelites exit Egypt and enter into the wilderness, they experience a water crisis. Now, listen, let me pause, okay? This is not my notes. I just thought of this, all right? That's my problem. (laughs) Why don't you put that in your notes? Because I'd still be typing. Um, One of the things we need to understand is when you read in the Old Testament, many of the things that you read, virtually all the things you read, are physical representations of things that go on spiritually. Okay? The wilderness was literal, but we go through it metaphorically, if you will. We go through it in a non-literal way. They were hot, they were tired, they were thirsty, literally. We feel those ways in the spirit realm in many ways. Now, we also go through those things physically, too. So it's amazing to me when I'm reading through this, the quickness I see of things like in Exodus and how they actually apply to us in in, in our world today. Hopefully this will be clear as we read through this right here. They leave Egypt as soon as they get into the wilderness. They journey three hot, sweaty days without any water, and they find themselves in a desperate situation. Finally, water is discovered, and they are relieved. Finally, we found water. But quickly, that relief is turned to despair when they discover that the water they find is undrinkable because it's bitter. Can you imagine that feeling? You're in a desert, you're thirsty, you find a body of water, you run to the body of water, and someone dips their hand into the water, and they taste it, and they can't drink the water. The water is bitter, it is sour, it is bad, it is turned undrinkable. And they complain to Moses, what are we supposed to drink? Now, you can use all of that to see in your own life, the typology of all those things. You get into a place, you think your answers have finally been discovered, you get to that thing that you think is going to fulfill you, you get to that thing that's going to quench your thirst, only to discover that thing doesn't quench your thirst, and you look to God and you're like, God, why? I thought you were going to give me what I prayed for. Why, 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 why are you letting me thirst? Why are you not meeting my needs? Here's this thing in front of me that I thought was going to meet my needs, and it's not meeting my needs. What's going on? And this is a legitimate request. You know, they're not complaining over dessert. They're not complaining that they didn't have a second helping of pot roast here. They're complaining over water. That's not a luxury. That is a necessity. You don't drink water, you die. So their request is legit. So their complaining makes sense. I would have been the first one in line. Hello, God? What's going on? But God, and this is so beautiful, and this is what I hope you grab a hold of, instructs Moses to toss a branch into the water. 
And when he takes the branch and he throws it into the water, the water becomes clean. God provides water. God provides life. God brought sweet from bitter. God brought life from death through a tree. Do you see the parallel? Through the cross. It's all going to happen. And it's all in typology for us to see where we're going to get life. Who's the, who's the water of life? Christ. How is it going to be sweet? Through the cross. They couldn't see all of that. They couldn't imagine all of that. But God led them through that and helped them to, to, to un- begin to understand one overall thing. Whatever you're going through, you can trust me. And I can take even bitter water and turn it sweet in a moment through a branch, through a tree. I've got a plan. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. You would think that would be enough. We'd be like, okay, fine. I'll trust you. The very next chapter, Exodus 16, they have famine. After the bitter water incident, the very next chapter, in Exodus, they go through another crisis. This time it's over food. That's a legitimate need. We need food. Again, it's not a luxury item. This is a need. The entire community begins to complain. They begin to grumble against Moses. They wish they had died in Egypt. That's literally what they say. At least back in Egypt, we had meat. At least back in Egypt, we had good food. You brought us out here in the wilderness to let us die. Again, God provides. And he does it through manna. Falls from heaven. He does it through quail that comes and just falls all over the ground. And they go out and they pick up quail. And they make manna sandwiches with the quail. And they eat and their heart is content. And they have everything that they need. God demonstrates He's capable of providing for their needs. If they would only trust Him. Who is God? Who is Christ? He is the bread of life. Manna. You've got the water of life. You've got the bread of life. It's all coming from the hand of God. You would have thought the Israelites would have learned. You would think we would learn. The very next chapter, Exodus 17, water from a rock. Another incident occurs. Here's the Israelites encounter a second water crisis. They quarrel with Moses. Give us water to drink. Now, isn't it interesting? In Exodus 15, they're needing water. God does a miracle. In Exodus 16, they need food. God does a miracle. Exodus 17, they're back to needing water, and they still do not trust God, and they cry out, what are we going to drink? And here, God instructs Moses to strike a large rock with his shepherd's staff. When Moses does, God provides a remarkable way, and he gushes water from the rock. The rock is a dead thing from non-life he brings life he brings something from nothing do you see the parallel again christ is beaten his body is broken and from his broken body water flows from his heart came blood and water you see it's all connected Christ was being seen and all these different things going on. It's in the wilderness where we see things we've never seen before. It's in the wilderness where Christ is revealed in a beautiful way. It's in the wilderness where our eyes are finally open. It was in the wilderness God showed all these things. And it was in this particular one here in Exodus 17. After the water, the bitter water turns sweet. After the manna and the quail fall from heaven. And after Moses strikes the rock and water comes from the rock. Finally, Moses looks at the people and he asks this question. Why do you put the Lord to the test? Through your complaining and through your belly aching, you're testing God. You're trying Him. Why, 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 why do you put the Lord to the test? Listen to me very carefully, and I know this is hard, and it's especially hard if you're in a tough place right now. And oh, if if somebody would have come to me during my darkest days, if somebody would have come to me during my anxiety-ridden phase, if somebody would have come to me whenever I was going through the most difficult thing and asked me that question right there, I'd have probably punched them. So I get it, and I say this gently. But just be careful, because grumbling again and again flirts with disaster. It's not that you're going to tick God off. God can handle your grumbling. 
It's not that you're going to make God mad at you. God can handle your whining. He can handle your complaining. He can handle your hurt. He can handle your tears. He can handle your wondering. He can handle your questions. He can handle it. But I'm telling you, you're flirting with disaster for your own transformation and for your own move forward because you're going to stunt yourself. You're going to stop yourself and you're going to just choke the faith and life out of yourself by grumbling and complaining again and again and again. It's in these in-between places. God is after something inside of you. God wants you to teach you something. And, and, and these people here in Exodus are missing it over and over and over again. They're missing it. God is permitting them to be exposed to difficult situations to prove to them again and again and again, I can be trusted. I can be trusted. You come up against bitter water, I can make it sweet. You come up to no food, I can make it fall from the sky. You come up to no water again, I can make water come out of a rock. You can trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. And again and again and again, they don't. Some of us are in a very difficult season right now. We are between spaces. We are a long way from where we used to be. We are a long way from where we want to be. We are in the between And we are missing the lessons. We are missing the opportunities for growth, for transformation, for maturity. We're missing them. Now listen, if this is a new season for you, you have just entered into this wilderness, I'm not talking necessarily to you. Yes, there are lessons. Yes, there are things for you to learn. Yes, there will be incredible lessons for you. You will grow in ways you never imagined. You will see things you've never seen before. But I'm talking especially to some of you who have literally been in the wilderness year after year after year. You still haven't learned. You still haven't grown. You whine and you complain and you bellyache and you whine and you complain and you bellyache over and over and over again. It's time to learn. It's time to grow. It's time to go, God, okay, fine. Teach me what it is you want to teach me. Because I'm telling you, if we continue with our current attitudes, we will deform our character, stunt our growth, and remain immature and walk through life aimlessly. So let me provide you several warnings, okay? Several warnings. Be careful as you are in this in-between space, this place. These are three warnings I want to give you to be very, very careful, very practical, okay? Number one, murmuring becomes a pattern. Be careful, murmuring becomes a pattern. Too often we think we can murmur and complain and everything goes back to normal. In other words, complaining is normal, just letting off some steam, you know, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. There is something called experience-dependent neuroplasticity. I'm going to test you on this afterwards, okay? You're going to have to write that down. It's going to be an essay question. Experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Say, what is that? It's the continuing creation and grouping of neuron connections in our brains taking place as a result of a particular experience. Neuroscience teaches us, and maybe, maybe this will be easier to remember, neuroscience teaches us neurons that fire together, wire together. What this means is whenever we think a thought, or have a feeling, or a physical sensation, thousands of neurons are triggered, and they all get together to form a neural network. Hey, she's thinking that thought. That's the second time she's thought that thought. Hey, come on over here. We need to help her think that thought a third time. Oh, she's thought it three times now. Hey, I need some more help over here. We need to build a highway because she's obviously going to think this often. And we need to expand the road to allow more traffic this way. Think it again and you get three lanes. Think it more, you get four lanes. Keep thinking it, you get an entire six to eight lane traffic and all your thoughts begin to fall right into that pathway. With repetitive thinking, the brain learns to trigger the same neurons each time. Basically, our brains cut ruts. 
Maybe you'll get this even better. You ever been on a tractor and you go to a farm or you go maybe your dad's property, your mom's property, and there's these ruts cut because the tractor's up and you try to get out of the ruts and it's easily to fall back into the ruts. That's our pathways of our brain. The more we think, the deeper those ruts become and the easier it is to get back into that again. Okay? After a while, when you keep having those thoughts and you keep practicing those thoughts, after a while, virtually no effort is required to think those thoughts ever. ever. It just happens. It's automatic. They become part of who we are. So murmuring becomes a pattern. Number two, our patterns shape our future. What do you think, what you think today becomes your actions tomorrow and eventually your destiny? Proverbs 4.23 from the New Century Version. This is not a quote from it. It's the, kind of a paraphrase of that. Be careful what you allow yourself to think. Guard who you are on the inside, because everything that you put in here eventually begins to control everything. Guard your heart, because out of it comes everything. Guard what you put in here, because everything comes out of it. Be careful, 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 be careful what you think. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we destroy Paul says, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts. Anybody have rebellious thoughts? Come on. (laughs) Am I the only one in the room that ever has a rebellious thought? A thought that I don't really need to think? A thought that isn't helpful? A thought that doesn't lead me to Christ? Does anybody ever have a rebellious thought that takes you away from peace? That takes you away from Christ-likeness? That takes you away from love? That takes you away from service? That takes you away from forgiveness? That takes you away from mercy? That takes you away from compassion? That takes you away from love? Does anybody ever have a thought that if you keep moving in that direction, you're going to end up a hundred miles away from what it is God wants you to think and how he wants you to live? Paul says we have to take those things and we got to capture those rebellious thoughts and teach them. Folks, teach is a process. Teach them to obey Christ. Murmuring becomes a pattern. Patterns shape our future. So many things are beyond your control. Let me give you the third one, then I'll tell you that. Number three, we choose what happens in us. Very, 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 very important. Many, 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 many things are beyond your control. Your parents' divorce, beyond your control. Your spouse's infidelity, in many ways, beyond your control. The economy, beyond your control. You develop cancer, someone else, some other disease, in many ways, beyond your control. Whether your body permits you to have children, beyond your control. A drunk driver that you meet, That's beyond your control. We can go on and on and on. But listen, this this is gold. I'm telling you, if you miss everything else, I hope you get this part. But your reaction to what happens is always within your control. Murmuring becomes a pattern. Our patterns shape our future. We choose what happens in us. The thoughts we have, we choose to allow them or to kick them out. To complain and to murmur or to say, you know what, I'm done with that. I'm not doing that anymore. One of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption. Anybody ever seen? Okay, love it. Andy Dufresne, he's the centerpiece of the film. He's sentenced to Shawshank, which is a corrupt prison. It's a prison for murderers and rapists. And, and he's in there for a crime he didn't commit. Andy breaks one of the cardinal rules of the prison, and he is sent to the hole, solitary confinement. Many of the people sent to the hole never make it out mentally. They can't take the seclusion, the loneliness, the deprivation, the darkness, the rejection. But Andy goes into the hole, and he stays for a long period of time, and he makes it. Mentally, he's strong when he comes out. And after his punishment, Andy tells the other prisoners that it was easy time. And one of the prisoners looks at him and says... Nobody in the hole can say that it's easy. None of of the time in the hole was easy. But Andy says it is because, and I love this line, he kept the music inside himself. The music, he loved music. And the music he would listen to, he would keep it in his head. 
He kept it inside himself because even though they can take away your freedom and even though they can close the door and put you in the hole and even though they can turn the lights out and even though they can seclude you, they can't get to the music that's inside you. Love that. He tells them basically that they can still be free inside and reach a higher level of humanity spiritually despite the fact that their bodies are locked away. Listen to me very carefully. That's what I'm talking about. No matter what happens to you, you can always choose what happens in you. Okay? That's what God was teaching the Israelites in the wilderness. You don't have any water, but trust me, your outside is really, really bad right now, but trust me. You don't have any food. The outside looks as if you have not what you need to live, but trust me. You're in another place where there's no water, but trust me. I can bring water. I can take a tree branch and throw it into the bitter water and turn it sweet. I can call for the quail all around this area and they will all come and drop at your feet. I can rain bread down from the sky. I can have my servant Moses strike the rock and bring water out of it. I'm telling you, in a moment's time, everything can change if you will choose what you do on the inside and try. Trust me no matter what's going on on the outside. And just know this, okay? We're always choosing something. We're always choosing something. Even if you think, well, I'm just going to be quiet right now. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to... You're choosing to be quiet. You're choosing not to say anything. We're always choosing something. So choose what's good, choose what's healthy, choose to move in the right direction. Some of us, I'm going to just give you these real quick. Some of us choose to withdraw emotionally. And that's what some of us have done. We have chosen in the middle of this pain, in the middle of this wilderness, to draw ourselves in, withdraw emotionally from our husband, from our wife, from our kids, from our friends. We've chosen to withdraw emotionally. And I'm telling you, this is a warning. It results in isolation and depression. Some of us have chosen to push all the pain under the surface. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. We just shove it down, shove it down, shove it down. I've seen this year after year after year. It results in stress and anger. We become stressed and we become angry people. You just It's almost like a balloon that's getting ready to pop and you just... Barely touching, boom. Is that you? Here's one real practical. It's going going, going to sting some of us, okay? Some of us choose retail therapy. You know what? If I bought that, I'd feel so much better. You know what? I just need a new car. That's what I need. You know what? We just need to move. We just need to get a new house. You know what? I need to add a room. You know what? I I need to charge something. You know, let's, let's go buy this. Let's go spend on that. I need some retail therapy. Typically what happens is waste and debt and waste and debt typically do not make your life better. And others of us, last one I'm going to give you is we choose revenge and we end up with hate and violence. We're always choosing something. We're always choosing something. The only question that I have for you today, and I know we're just kind of introducing this, and hopefully you've got something from this, and we'll get into this next, next week and the week after, is how do we respond to what's going on? Folks, there, there have been times in my life where the darkness I felt was overwhelming, and I, I'm not implying that uh, I understand what you're going through. I don't. I don't. And that is a sacred space for you. And I don't want to step into that and act as if I know what you're going through. But I know for me, there have been times in my life where the darkness felt overwhelming. And I didn't always respond the right way. I've taken out so much anger and frustration and hurt and confusion on those around me. 
I've pushed people away. I've pushed my wife away. I've pushed my kids away. And I've learned over the last 10 years, probably, more than probably ever have in my life, that I can't control everything that happens around me. I've tried. If I do this and this and this and this and this, I can predict what's going to happen. I couldn't predict that person. I couldn't predict the economy. I couldn't predict this family. I couldn't predict this health issue. I couldn't predict on and on. But how we respond, how we respond, how we respond depends, determines where you go. Our choices are opportunities. That's what they are. To grow, to mature, to trust. And listen to me carefully. This is the last thing I'm going to give you that we're going to pray. I'm not suggesting... We can't pour out our pain and we can't pour out our frustration and anger. We can and we must pour those things out. You read through the Psalms, I mean, the the psalmist are crying out to God and fussing and complaining and God, why and how come? And you read the book of Job, Job pours his heart out and doesn't understand. I'm not saying you can't question. I'm not saying you can't cry, you can't weep. I'm not saying you can't even complain to God. I think it's healthy and good that we're honest and transparent and we come before him as we are. But I've also learned there comes a time when you choose to say, I'm done. And now I've got to move forward. When King David's son became sick, the story tells us that David wept, he prayed, he cried, he fasted. But when the baby died, David knew that it was time to move forward. I can't tell you, nor will I ever tell you when it's time to move forward. And I doubt your moving forward will be in a straight line. You'll probably move forward and then back, and then move forward and then back. And then you'll move to the right, then you'll move to the left. And then you'll move forward and then you'll move back. And the line to where you need to be and where you are will not look up and to the right. It'll go up and then it'll go down and then it'll go up and then it'll go down. But hey, just as long as you're moving forward, I'm right there with you. I get it. I understand it. Just... There's going to come a time at some point in your life where you say enough's enough. It's time for me to stand up and move forward. And I'm going to trust God. Let's go back to Mary. She's a teenager. She's been thrown into a complicated, frightening, confusing, overwhelming situation. She is carrying the hopes and dreams of generations, the promised, prophesied, anticipated Messiah in her womb. Few believe her, most doubt her. She's got to endure accusations of adultery, even from her fiancé, who at first thinks that he should just quietly divorce her and put her away. Her body expands, her sleep disrupts, her appetite changes, she feels sick, she is tired, people laugh at her, people mock her, people question Joseph. What does she do for nine long, brutal, confusing months she trusts? She trusts. And in the end, the babies cry breaks of the darkness and the Messiah is born and all the world rejoices that he is here and it comes through a period of wilderness in Mary's life it comes through a period of darkness in Mary's life just like it will in yours just like it does in mine you can hold on to hope to trust him all right We'll pick it up next week. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that if we will just trust you and believe you, you will do amazing things, things beyond our comprehension, and we will stand back at the end of it all and be absolutely amazed at what you've accomplished. We love and honor and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.